Well, good morning, church. Isn't that awesome to hear testimonies, current testimonies? They weren't testifying things that happened years ago. These are testimonies of the power of God changing lives because they said yes. They said yes to leave the, up the UP and go somewhere totally new to Argentina. And we've gotten to speak and be a part of the kingdom there. That is awesome, right? That's good news. I remember years ago, um, I grew up uh, at a church and we had sun in. I got to take my shoes off. Is that okay? Okay. I don't smell. I wash, but I just cannot wear shoes. It drives me crazy. I feel trapped. Um, but I remember years ago when on a Sunday night service, I heard missionaries come to our church and share just what the power of God of what his love did to people. And I remember coming as a little kid coming to the altars and saying, yes, then I want in. I want to be a part of sharing God's love and seeing lives transformed, seeing the Mario's that just a hug transformed their lives. And now they are walking in confidence, walking in the identity that God has for them. And, uh, and that's just, I just thank you guys for sharing because I love hearing amazing testimonies of what God's doing, right? All right. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to open up to two spots or your cell phones. I want you to open up to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 and Acts chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9 and Acts chapter 9. And, uh, and I'm going to share with you one of my epic fails. All right? So we got to hear a lot of testimonies to inspire you, to encourage you, to be like, yes, Lord. You know, like that's what it does to me. Every time I hear this, I'm like, yes, I want to do it. And how many of you know that walking with God is a journey? right? Walking with God is a journey and I fail all the time. But guess what? Failure is not something that disqualifies you. It's actually the thing that qualifies you, right? Right? Because we were all sinners. We were all sinners and God loves us and he found us. And so he qualifies us so that we can all be comfortable because some of you just need to get comfortable. You're like, I've never been to second service. This is weird, okay? I'm like a first servicer. I sit on that same spot. I'm like one of those people that go to the same place every single time. You know, you got your seats. You know, I sit in the same spot every time. I'm a first servicer, so I'm so glad I actually get to know the second half of our church, right? I mean, I say hi to you, but I'm not actually in church with you. So I'm, it's, it's a privilege to be here, really. By the way, Pastor Richard says hi. He did a wedding in Florida and uh, yesterday for Kimmy Buckner, one of the girls that grew up here, and she got married yesterday, and, uh, and then he's doing ministry in Tampa. Pastor Kelvin married another girl, Aaliyah Francis, who got married in Tennessee yesterday, so that is why they are both not here, because we have lots of weddings. We had 10 weddings this year. Isn't that crazy? Within the young adults, that's a lot of weddings. All right. Lots of people feeling the love. So I wanted to share with you my episode. If you need a partner, if you need a spouse, you're looking for that mate. We meet on Wednesday night, 7 p.m., right there. I'm telling you, something's in the water right now. I mean, these people weren't even dating a year ago, and they started dating and are married a year later. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's a real anointing we got here, okay? <laughs> All right. So my epic fail. Are you guys ready for this? All right. You can't judge me, okay? I know I'm going to get emails after this. People are like, oh, Sarah, you're not a failure. It's okay. I don't feel like a failure. I'm just sharing it because we all fail. All right. So... Any of you ever hear a message on raising Lazarus from the dead? Anyone ever hear that, right? All right, so years ago, years ago, probably like almost 17 years ago, we were having powerful services. I mean, just powerful encounters with the Lord. Damon Thompson was here. He was preaching. I mean, God was just doing amazing things. And one night in particular, I remember him preaching a story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. All right, and I remember he was talking about the power of God and how he wants us to participate and bringing people from the dead, you know, spiritually and physically. And I mean, there was testimonies. It was amazing. You know what I'm saying? Like services where you're like, yes, and you're like, I want to be a part of that, right? No. Yes. Yes. We want to be a part of it. I'm used to talking to young adults, and so they smile at me periodically. So maybe you could help me out and do that. Okay, maybe I hear, yeah, yeah, we can do that. Yeah, okay. I can do, or I can do it to myself. It doesn't matter. I can encourage myself. All right, so here we go. I'm in this service. The power of God, I mean, it is just amazing. The anointing is there, and we are all saying yes. Yes, Lord, use me. Just like another powerful encounter that I had as a kid. I just want to be a part of changing lives, right? God's life changed mine, so I want other people to know this amazing God that loves us. 
So I happen to work at a funeral home. All right, those of you that are going in the ministry, normally you don't get paid, and I wasn't getting paid. I was the associate youth pastor at a big church. I wasn't getting paid, so I had to work two jobs. So I worked at a restaurant, and my other part-time job was at a funeral home. Exciting stuff, right? My job was during funerals were just to walk on, love people, ask them if they need anything, just you know, be a blessing to them. That was what my whole job was. But on the off days, like Mondays and Tuesday nights, when nobody was really having funerals, I just answered the phone. I was by myself, I would answer the phone. So Friday night, I'm saying, yes, Lord, use me. I want to be a part of raising the dead. I want people to be impacted. I want to win my city to the Lord. I go to work Tuesday. I'm sitting all by myself. The phones really aren't ringing. I'm just there, you know? And all of a sudden, I'm like, man, I said yes to Jesus on Friday night. I mean, I said I could raise the dead, right? Jesus said, greater things will you do. You know what I'm saying? Like, the same spirit that lives in Christ Jesus lives in me. So I'm like, there are a bunch of dead bodies below me. Because there's a morgue. And so I know that if I pray, if I get in the Holy Ghost, we can have a party. And I start to dream. I'm like, think about it. All of Farmington Hills impacted with the love of God because someone's dead mama is getting raised from the dead. Families are saved. The city is transformed. I mean, this is all right here. Like I'm just in a funeral home by myself. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes too much time on your hands is not always good. Okay? Even when you're dreaming the thoughts of God, okay? I mean, I am just excited. So I start praying. Some of you are getting nervous. Don't worry. Don't be nervous. This is an epic fail, not a, you're going to be even more scared. Okay, so anyways... So here we go. I'm praying. I'm worshiping Jesus. You know, like you just got to get in the spirit. You know, you don't know what to pray until you're in the spirit, right? You don't just pray whatever you want to pray. So get in the spirit. I'm having a worship time with Jesus. I start getting in my groove. I am like, you know, you're praying now, calling down heaven. You're like declaring the word of God. My faith is rising and I am beginning to declare the word of God. And the dead man will rise and Lazarus comes forth. And I mean, probably after an hour, hour and a half, I am there. My faith is like up there. You know what I'm saying? Like I am believing for a miracle in Farmington and that people are going to get saved because one of these mamas is. And all of a sudden, while I stop and pause just for a moment to wait upon the Lord, I hear a... Did I just hear something? I mean, like, all of a sudden, I'm like, wait a minute, I didn't hear anything. Did I just hear something? Sheer panic goes through my body. And I literally run from where I'm praying, go into the main office and lock the door. I am now scared to death. I get down on my knees and say, God, I changed my mind. Kill him again. And I literally, I was just done. I was terrified. I want him dead. I want him dead. If that's really them, I want him dead. Because all I kept thinking about was, a naked woman coming up the stairs, walking out of the funeral home. How do I explain that to anyone? It would be so scary. I share that with you because it was real, number one. I have no idea if that person raised for the dead. We'll never know because I told him to be dead again. You know what I'm saying? But the Lord has taught me a lot about the journey, about our journey with God and our journey of faith and believing and wanting to have an impact. And one of the things I've asked over the years is like, God, what did I do wrong in that scenario? Like, I had such faith. I wanted to see it. You know, I, I wanted to see my community changed. And two things the Lord really just kind of put it, just put in my spirit. And the first thing was this. He said, Sarah, you were trying to solve a problem in your own way. Hmm. You see, I saw my city, and I could think of everything that was wrong with it. I could think of how broken lives were. And so my, in my, just my innocence and my immaturity, I thought, well, if I raise someone from the dead, then they would encounter the love of God, and then their problems would be solved because then they would know the Lord. And that sounds holy, and it sounds so religious. Because it takes God out of the picture, so to speak, because he did not give me the idea in the beginning. He didn't impart that in that moment. Hey, Sarah, why don't you lead this? Why don't you? All of a sudden, the reason why I was doing it was because I heard an awesome message. The second thing the Holy Spirit put in my heart was this. 
I underestimate the value of a love encounter with Almighty God to individual lives. And so there's a part of me that would be, ra- I would rather have the Lord work in the big and the mysterious and the signs and wonders because it takes me off the hook. Because it's easier to pray for revival. It's easier to want God to move in this building and pray for the souls outside than actually know people. I had no idea. And the Holy Spirit just spoke. It's because you underestimate the value and the power of my love. It doesn't take away the supernatural. But it's not one or the other. And as I read through the Gospels, Jesus' life clearly demonstrates both. He clearly demonstrates a life that, yes, has supernatural, but he clearly demonstrates that Jesus valued loving people more than anything else. And if you have your Bibles, I want us to look at a very short passage of Scripture in Matthew. Because if we're Jesus followers, then to me, we got to look at what Jesus did, right? Like, if that's who we say we're following, that's who changed our lives, then let's see what Jesus placed value on. And let's place value on the things that he valued. Right? All right, so Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 9. It's up on the screens if you don't have it. And it says this. Oh, I need that clicker again. I keep for, I've never done this before, so my clicker. We don't have this. <laughs> All right. Oh, maybe you did it, because I didn't do it. All right. As Jesus passed by on from there... So he's on a journey, right? Just want to clarify that? Just right off the bat. Envision Jesus going on a walk. Going from point A to point B, all right? As Jesus passed by from there, he saw a man called Matthew. Everybody say the word, he saw. saw. Wait a minute, I don't think you got it. So say, he saw. saw. So his eyeballs. Lord, looking around, he's on a journey, he's looking at nature, he's looking at the dirt on the road, and all of a sudden he's like... I see you. All right? Eye contact. He sees someone. Not just like, hey, I glanced at you and I didn't even notice. No, he saw you. He he saw a man called Matthew sitting at a tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw that they said this to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? I know none of us have ever asked that question. None of us have ever judged anyone else by that same standard right there. Like, you're friends with who? Why are you hanging out with your neighbors and going to that party? Right? No, okay, maybe I'm just the only one that struggles with that. All right, you guys are good. All right. But Jesus, when he heard it, he said, those that are well have no need for a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but to call the sinners. Church, Jesus modeled for us living a life, just living everyday life. He wasn't a pastor. He wasn't a missionary. He wasn't an evangelist or whatever term that we seem to put that people that do certain professions should live in certain ways. Jesus was a carpenter's son. He learned how to be a carpenter. He was an everyday blue-collared worker. He worked with his hands. He hung around the same town that he grew up in. It's like living in Oxford or Rochester. It's just a small town. And it says that when he was walking somewhere, he stopped what he was doing because he saw someone. Church, I want to remind you this morning that God sees you. God sees you. He doesn't just love the whole world and doesn't notice you. God sees each and every one of us. Someone in this room may be feeling and wondering, does God even know that I'm alive? Maybe everything seems to go wrong, whether it's health, whether it's finances, whether it's marriage, whether it's just overwhelming, feeling insecure and lonely. Wondering, does my life have value? Can I tell you, church, Jesus models and reveals the Father. He says, anything that I do, it's because of the Father. If you know me, you know my Father. We serve a God. 
A God who loves each and every one of you and knows you by name. He knows every hair on your head. He sees you when you are crying. He sees you when you are happy. And he loves you. And he says that you have value. I remember being in one of those moments, one of those seasons where I just felt forgotten. Anyone ever feel that way? Anyone? Can you just get real? Anyone? Thank, thank you for being real. One person. Okay, I got another. Right. We all do. You could be surrounded by a thousand people. You could have, a, you know, tons of followers on Facebook and Instagram. And yet you can feel alone. And I remember I was just in the season like none of my prayers were being answered. Anyone ever feel that way? Yes. My prayers were not being answered. And I'm like, okay, I am trusting you. I'm doing what we say. I'm reminding myself of God's promises. I'm trusting him because whether I see it or not happens, he's still faithful. Whether God still does what I think he promised me, I know that it's not him. It's got to be me somewhere. Because he is faithful. It's who he is. Maybe I misunderstand. Maybe I don't know how to interpret things. But God is faithful. And I remember just being in one of those times, just trying to encourage myself in the Lord, reading my Bible, but just feeling like, man, God, do you even see me? Sounds silly. Our finances were super tight in the season of our life. I mean, we all have seasons where they're super tight. But it was just super tight. And one of the things that I love more than anything is going out to eat. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like the sixth love language in my book. You know, I created our own, my whole family, we love it. Like, how I feel loved is take me out to eat. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to make my own salad. I want you to make me a salad and put all the things I love on it, and then I want you to clean it up. It is a gift from God. You know what I'm saying? It is, oh, it is like amazing. I don't, it's just amazing. And I was just in one of those moments. Nothing was just kind of going that way because that's just life. And I felt like the Holy Spirit just kind of simply whispered during my prayer time that time, you know, while I was talking like, Sarah, I love you. And I was like, I know. But like, could you just show me a little bit? You know what I'm saying? Did anyone ever ask the Lord just to show it a little bit, you know? And so I remember I was just going about my day. We were super tight with finances, and I really wanted to stop at our favorite restaurant and get a salad. And I'm, like, torn, you know, like, eh, good decision, bad decision. Well, I really don't need to spend that extra eight bucks to get that salad. But, man, my salads just don't taste the same. You know what I'm saying? And it's my favorite salad, and they know me, and it's like, I love that place, right? And so I'm going through this whole thing. Finally, I was like, I don't care about the budget. I'm getting a salad. You know what I'm saying? Bad, I'm not telling you to throw away your budgets. This is not what we're talking about. But... I made the decision, I went in there, and I just felt like this, like, just go get a salad. So I go in there. I walk in, I go to get my salad, and the owner comes up to me and he says, by the way, your salad's on me today. He said, I just want to know that we value you. Can I tell you, someone who is, I have no idea where they are in their walk with God, was used by the Father to tell me the very words that I was longing to hear. You see, so often, God does not, he uses people. In our lives, in our everyday lives, God uses people to do his will and to show us that we are loved, that we are valuable. And to you guys, that salad probably is like, that's silly and that's petty. But to me, I drove home and I wept. Because Father God loved me so much to love me in my love language that most people devalue. <laughs> but I felt so loved because the man said the same words that I was asking God to say. And Jesus was walking and he saw a man named Matthew. A man who was doing something that was probably not cool. He was doing something that was probably illegal by our terms. Most tax collectors during that time lied and cheated poor people to make extra money as they were taking money for the government. Most of the time, tax collectors came out of that very city. So he was cheating out family members, friends. These were the despised. These were the ones that were gaining off of other people's problems. And yet Jesus looks at Matthew and says, I don't care about the life that you're living. I don't care with what you are. Because I know that if you know that you are loved, if you en encounter my love, then everything in your life will change. Because every heart is craving and looking for real love. Every heart, even the hardest of hearts, is craving an encounter with real, tangible love. 
And Jesus saw him. He stopped what he was doing. He left his disciples and said, Matthew, come follow me. And it says that Matthew got up and Jesus went and had a dinner with him and all his friends. Isn't it amazing that Jesus was not afraid of their sin? I think in the beginning, we're so overwhelmed by God's love, we're just grateful he's not scared of our sins. Right? When we first encounter the love of the Lord, we're just like, thank you. That you love a sinner. Some of you right now, you need to know, you need to be reminded, God does not judge you according to your sin. He wants you to encounter your, his love. Because it's the love of God that changes us. It's the love of God that transforms a heart and mind. Jesus was not scared of their sin. He sat down and made relationships. You see, Jesus was not inviting Matthew to join a church. Jesus was not inviting Matthew to agree with his doctrine. Jesus was not agreeing him to say, hey, you need to go on Romans Road and, and memorize these scriptures and then change before you come and hang out with me. Because Jesus understood it's not about rules. It's not about even the right belief system. Jesus understands that if he could come and be in his presence and invite him into his friendships, invite him into his community, into his life, then Matthew would never be the same. Church, think about this. He never invited him to a synagogue. He went to his house and had a meal. That is the power that Jesus placed on somebody being loved, being invited into community, being into the, somebody's world and not just a mission. What the Babcocks are talking about is the lives. They are living this life. And their life, loving Jesus and bringing people involved, has a natural impact on those around them. And now those people are beginning to release the love of God. It's a friendship. It's a relationship. It's not a preacher. It's not an evangelist. It's everyday life. Telling people that you are loved. You are valued. So how does this flesh out? How do we do this? How, how do we live this out as followers of Christ? I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read the word, I put Jesus like over here in this category and then me in this category. Right? Because I know the Bible says that he was flesh and he was not, you know, he was not functioning in that same realm. But you know what? I'm always like, well, Jesus knew things that I don't know yet. Like he had a greater revelation. So I kind of put him like on this category and me over here. Anyone else struggle with that? You know, like you read the Bible and you're like, I want to be, I'm a Jesus follower. You've impacted my life. I can do these things. But there's still sometimes a separation. So what I've learned to do is I just study the gospel. And that's, my, that's where my prayer life is. Like, God, help me to think like that. Like, help me to know I'm a daughter, the same way that Jesus functioned as a son. Like, help me to function out of my identity, because Jesus functioned out of this secure place in love with the Father, knowing who he was. And so he was able to walk with such confidence. And that is where my prayer life really gets fleshed out. Like, that's what I want. I want to love like Jesus did and live so secure in it. Not to prove anything. But then when I read the word, I love reading the book of Acts. Because a lot of times the book of Acts helps me, the, helps me with the how to do it. Right? Like the how to. Because the book of Acts is stories of the church living after Jesus left. So it's around the same time that we have. Because they have the power of the Holy Spirit, yet they actually weren't physically with Jesus. So, right? That's us. We're the church. So I want to just end my last 10, 15 minutes, and I want to just do the how-tos. Is that okay? Anyone like you want to know how to do it? I love a good cheerlead, but man, do I want to know when I go home, how am I going to do this, right? All right. So Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9. There's a story. Paul used to be Saul. He has this, he's throwing threats, he's killing a bunch of Christians. This is his story right before it. He gets kicked off his donkey. God is doing an amazing work in his life, but God doesn't finish it. He just leaves him half there, okay? Well, I'll, don't worry, we'll get back to that. Some of you are like, huh? Don't worry about it, we'll catch on. Okay, verse 10, right here, Acts chapter 9, verse 10. It says, now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. There's a believer. He's a follower of the way. He's a follower of Jesus, all right? 
So if you're a follower here of Christ and you're saying, in my journey with God, I would say, I'm a follower. Like, I want, I'm a disciple. Like, I want to know what Jesus did. I want to live that way. That's what he was. Ananias is a follower. And he says, the Lord spoke to him in a vision calling Ananias. He said, yes, Lord. Verse 11, the Lord said, go to Straight Street to the house of Judas. And when you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me right now. And I have shown him a vision of the man named Ananias coming to him and laying hands on him so that he can see again. So just real quick, is Paul waiting to encounter the love of Jesus or is he just waiting there because he's blind? According to this small passage of scripture. Because he's blind, right? So here you have somebody who is murdering hundreds of Christians, hundreds of believers. He just stoned Stephen. And he has got a letter in his hand that says, I'm going to kill some more. He has an encounter with the Lord Almighty, and God speaks to him and reveals himself to him and leaves him blind and says, go to this house and wait for this guy. So Paul, at this point, or Saul, in this moment, is not waiting to encounter the love of God. He just wants a miracle. I would say that's pretty fair. Maybe he was, maybe. I can't, I can't judge, but that's just what the story says. All right, it says this. Um, So that he can see again. Verse 13. This is Ananias, the disciple of the way. This is his response. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias. He exclaimed it. He wasn't like, but Lord. He was like, but Lord. Do you understand? I've heard many people, not just one or two. I've heard many people talk about the terrible things that this man has done to the believers. He's like, God. Do you know what you are asking me to do? Like, they're killing your people. That's, do you know the many stories? I mean, like one or two might be lying, but many people are talking about this guy is horrible. I mean, talk about injustice. He's just killing them. And they're your people? Keep reading. And now he's authorized by the leading priests to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. Ananias is saying, God, that's me. Do you know that he's on his way? He can arrest me, my family, my friends, my fellow believers. This is a real conversation. In verse 15, the Lord says, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to the kings and as well to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Verse 17, I love this. It says, So Ananias went. And he found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. You see, he was just waiting to have his sight regained, but Jesus said, I got a whole lot more plans for you. I see your potential. I see the calling that I put on you since the beginning of time. Saul, you think that this is your plan, but I know who you really are. And Ananias goes and says, I am declaring the word of the Lord over you. God has plans more than to heal your physical body. God wants your destiny to be pulled out. He wants you to walk in the fullness of your identity. He says instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he regained his sight and was baptized. I love this story. I literally could preach on it probably every week. This to me, every time I read this story, something new comes up. Church... This is the how-to. This is a believer, a disciple of the way, who is obedient to the call of God. I want to just show you three things out of it real fast. The how-to. Number one, Ananias, I believe, was able to impact, have such an impact on the rest of the world. Think about the lives that were saved because of Paul. Every life that heard the gospel through the writings of Paul Every person that got saved throughout the New Testament was a a result because of Ananias' obedience. Think about the impact of one person making themselves available to the Lord. One impact, not to preach the gospel, not to be an evangelist, not to leave and go to another country, but just to say yes, to obey God to one divine appointment. To one random act of kindness, Ananias was available to God. He gave God time. I was thinking about the fact of, man, what does it take to have um, a vision from the Lord? Right? 
I was thinking about that. You know, like you don't have just visions from the Lord like when you're driving a car. That, you'd get in a car wreck, right? A vision is something that you can see that's not really there, right? Anyone tr tracking with me? You having visions while you're driving? No, you're driving off the road, right? You're going to be seeing heaven. You're not seeing heaven right there, but you'd be going there. God doesn't give you visions while you're shopping at the mall, right? Because you're going to be running into like clothing racks and knocking things down and being annoying to all the workers. Come on, smile. Yeah. Just walk up and smile at you. You have visions when you give God time. Ananias gave God time to speak. He was a disciple. Jesus gave God time to speak to him. And so Ananias is like, I'm going to give God time to say whatever he wants. So much of the time when I was younger, I, did, I would always worry about what to say to God. You know, like during your prayer times, like, what do I say? And I've just learned the longer that I'm walking with Jesus, I study his word, I have worship time, and then I sit and wait. And I say, God, is there anything you want me to say? Is there anything you want me to pray? Ananias was available. In a culture that is so fast-paced, isn't that a lost art? Being willing to slow down. Can I tell you where I slow down? In my bathroom. This is real spiritual right here. When I sit on the toilet and I get to lock the door, yes, Lord, because it's the only time I'm alone. People don't leave me alone. I got three little kids and they're always needing something, right? And so I have just learned when I'm on the toilet, I'm not bringing my cell phone in there. That's not time to catch up on Facebook. I need to just sit in peace and quiet and close my eyes and say, Lord, if there is anything you need to say to me, now's the time, right? When we're available. And don't worry, we're, we have a plan. We have things, you know, I make other time for the Lord. But that's throughout my regular day of when I'm available. Another time I'm available for the Lord is normally at midnight, right? From 12 to 5, no one needs me in my house. So very often I'm learning that the Lord wakes me up and I can't sleep. You know those like, why is everyone else? I'm so tired. Why can I not go to sleep? You know what I'm saying? My son was up puking the other day. You know, they only wake up puking at 2, 3 in the morning. That's the only time puke really comes. Never at the convenient hours. Jude wakes up puking. We went to bed at like 12.30. We've had company all weekend. And it's just been, it's been fun. We're just busy. I just was so excited to go to sleep. My son Jude's up puking. Um, after he gets done for an hour, it was disgusting. And then he gets done and he just passes out. He's like there. And I am wide awake. I am like, you have pulled me out of my REM sleep. I was in a great dream. And now I'm like, whoa. And you know what? I've just learned. The Lord's like, you want to come away with me? And I'm like, ah, I just want to sleep. Let's get real. Who's like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> I got energy, but not then. I'm just being real. But I just felt that just that the simple wooing of the Holy Spirit. Like you can't sleep anyways. You want to be together? And so I just sat and I just waited. I said, God, what do you want me to pray about right now? What do you want to say to me? Ananias was just available. He just gave God time. The second thing that I think that the how to, how to do this, how to impact people, how to love people and show the value, the number two thing I see is Ananias was surrendered to God. Ananias was surrendered to God. And this is the reason why I see this. Is Ananias, in his time with the Lord, he heard the voice of the Lord, and then you see something very beautiful happen. You see Ananias get really honest. God said, this is what I want you to do. <clears throat> Ananias didn't have this religious re relationship with the God. He was very real. He says, but God. And then he begins to tell God, like, do you know who this man is? Do you know that he's killed people? Do you know that he's done all these horrible things? You know what Ananias was doing in that moment? He was bearing his soul. He was showing God. He was saying, you know what? This is what I'm afraid of. This is my fear. This is my prejudice. 
This is the icky parts of me that you are calling me out of right now, and I don't think I can do it. How many of us, if we were really gut honest, that we all struggle to love certain, people, certain groups of people? No one is disqualified because we're humans. Most of us just actually don't want to admit it. But man, politics can sure ignite that. What if God looked at us? And regardless of whatever side you're on, what if the Lord looked at you and said, I want you to go to the leading voice that is speaking contrary to everything that you believe and love, and I want you to love them. You see, God doesn't care about politics. He doesn't care about social agendas. God cares about people. He cares about people, knowing that they are loved and valued. I shared with the other, I shared with the first service, I used to pray, I mean, I'm so grieved, my heart is so heavy against, you know, the people that are stuck in sex trafficking, the women that are being abused, the children that are being abused. It is something that my heart just burns for. And I remember early on when I began to start praying, I, I was like, God, like, I just want these girls to know who you are. I want you to show up and I want you just to kill all the guys involved. Right? That was what my thought process was. I was like, I just want, can you just kill him? And then these women can stop being abused. These poor children can stop being abused. Can I tell you, the Holy Spirit is so loving. I mean, I just found the, you know, I'm reading the word of God and I'm reading about the love of God and how no, God doesn't want anyone, you know, to not know who he is. And I'm like reading scriptures and I start feeling so convicted. Because God says he doesn't want anyone to perish without knowing him. What? Even those people? that are causing such destruction, such wounds, devaluing the very thing I'm so passionate about is people to know how valuable they are. Like, God, those people, why can't I just pray that? So I felt convicted and I repented because God loves them. And I said, okay, God, I'll pray for their souls, but I'm going to pray that they become blind. (laughs) Because you can still get saved and be blind at the same time, right? 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 (laughs) That was just me. I'm just being real, okay? But you know what I'm saying? Because think about it. There's people in our lives that we have preconceived ideas about the way that they live, the way that they treat people, about this and that. And it's very easy to begin to shut them out and say, God, I don't want anything to do with them. And yet we're praying for revival. We're praying for souls to be saved. And yet we are walking with no love. Ananias was surrendered because he gave it all to the Lord. He confessed his fear. He confessed his judgment. He confessed his prejudice. He confessed the ugly inside of his heart. He says, God, I don't want to heal this guy. I don't want this guy to be changed. I don't don't care about my family. I care about the impact that he might have on them. How many of us have not reached our neighbors because we're afraid of what their lifestyles might do to us? How many of us don't hang out with unbelievers because we're worried about being changed by them? Jesus was never worried about it because he knew greater than he is in me than he that is in the world. He knew that love is so powerful. Love can change a life. When somebody encounters the almighty love, then you are changed. Sin is not something to be afraid of. It's something to deal with with God. You see, we don't love until we actually pray and until we're actually real. Ananias was surrendered to the Father, and in the end, he said, God, you're Lord, and I'm not. How many of us in this sitting, in this moment in our lives, do we need to look at a situation in our lives and say, you know what, my feelings, my natural understanding, my natural wisdom, it doesn't make any sense, God. To do your ways don't make any sense with my finances. I can barely make ends meet. But God, you're God, and I'm not, and so I'm going to give you my tithe. God, I'm going to be faithful because my boss is a jerk. Nothing's going my way, and yet you called me to honor. 
You called me to speak words of life. And so, God, it doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't, it, it, nothing can change. But I'm going to begin to declare your word because my boss is a son of God. My boss is a daughter of God. Because Ephesians 1 says that everyone was predestined before the beginning of time to be sons and daughters of God. So I'm going to begin to submit to your authority and not just my limited understanding. That's what Ananias did. He surrendered. And because of his surrender, the third thing I see, and this is my last point, is he was empowered to love. I don't know about you, but when I read the, the parables of Jesus, I'm always moved. He always says he was moved with compassion. And one of the times that it bothers me the most, I know, I shouldn't be bothered by Jesus, but I, what, I really am. Like, he, he, he finds out his cousin is dead. John the Baptist he finds out he's dead, and it says that Jesus wanted to go away and just mourn and grieve. And it says the crowds found out where he was, and he went and they went and followed him. And they brought their sick to be healed. And when I read that, something inside of me just makes me angry. Like, really? Like, that is not boundaries, Jesus. Like, I got boundaries, and I can tell people no. You know what I'm saying? Like, someone just passed away. My kid's puking their guts out. When a neighbor comes over, I can say, come back another day. Right? Isn't that our natural human being to self-preserve? Like, we have our boxes, and, you know, we don't, we don't want to be too overwhelmed. And normally it's the things of God that we don't want to be overwhelmed with. We get our lives so full ourselves, and then when the Lord, you know, puts something on us, we're like, no, now I'm too overwhelmed. I gotta have boundaries, Lord. You can't be asking that. I gotta work on my marriage, my children, my finances. I gotta take care of my health. You can't be asking me to do anything else and serve people or love people, right? Isn't it funny how we prioritize things? But Ananias knew the life of Jesus. He heard the stories. And Jesus, even in a moment where he was grieving himself, was somehow empowered to have compassion on the people that he saw. I believe as I read the Gospels, I believe as I read Jesus' lives, you constantly see that there is grace and there is spirit empowerment when you are obedient to do the things the Father puts on your heart to do. In the moment, he says them. You might not have the grace the week earlier. You might not have the strength or the love or the capacity when he gives you the dream. But when the moment is now, but when the moment when the Holy Spirit speaks and says, now, I want you to say this to your coworker. Now, I want you to pay for that woman's groceries. Now, I want you to give that waitress $100 because she's going through something. Now, I want you to just share your testimony with this individual. Now, I want you to pray for someone at your job. The Holy Spirit is at work in that person's lives, and you don't know what's going on. Church, can I tell you this amazing thing? You don't have love yourself, but when the Holy Spirit says now, the Holy Spirit gives you supernatural love. Because you begin to see with new eyes. You begin to see how valuable that person is. And you can't help yourself. And when you move, not before. When Ananias went and was obedient to the Lord, it then says, he walked up to Paul. He walked up to Saul and he said, Brother Saul. And it says he laid hands on him. Church, he didn't just go and heal that man. He wasn't just obedient to that man. He was filled with the love of the Father because he began to say something that in the natural he had no business saying. He said, Brother Saul. He said, I'm inviting you to be a part of my family. I am seeing the destiny that's on your lives. You can have community with my family. You can have relationships with my family because I see that God's hand is on you. And so I'm going to value you not based on what you do, not on your past, not on your current situation. I'm going to begin to prophesy and speak life over you and invite you into my world. Brother Saul. Isn't that what we all want? Isn't that what we all crave? Isn't that why some of us are even here this morning? It wasn't for the word of the worship. You just want to belong. You want to be invited into community. Why? Because that's at every heart wants to know is, am I valuable? Am I worth loving? Am I worth knowing? And God says, yes. And he did it first with us. 
church, he loves you. He loves you. And his desire is that we would then walk in that love and that confidence and release it in tangible, practical, moment lives where we're available and we say yes to God. When we're walking in the grocery stores, we're walking in the schools and we say yes. Because all of a sudden the Holy Spirit drops a thought. One of the ideas that the Holy Spirit gave Ben and I, I, we, I think we were reading a book years ago, was talking about Halloween. And, and so we were like, man, what a great thing. Everyone in our neighborhood, they were talking about how Halloween is one of the one nights a year that everyone comes to your house. They don't come for Christmas. They don't come for Easter. But one day a year, all your neighbors show up to your house. And so Ben and I just started dreaming and praying and saying, man, what could we do to be the best house on the neighborhood? Like, the best house. Like, now I'm not talking about decorations, but that everyone that came to our neighborhood, they would know that they are loved and that they are important and that we value them. And so the Lord just gave us this idea. We're going to do hot chocolate, hot apple cider, big Tim Horton donuts for everyone that comes through, the best candy on the block. I'm not talking about the hard, nasty candy that nobody wants, you know what I'm saying? I'm not giving them that. I'm not giving them some weird track and patting them on the back and giving them, you know, like a nickel. I was like, Ben, let's just dream. Can I tell you, my husband is amazing. He releases our finances and says, this is so valuable. Let's, let's bless our neighbors. And so for the last 10 years, every night, we throw a party for our neighbors, for all the kids and we just say, you know what? You're loved. The first neighborhood we did it in, it wasn't very, you know, it wasn't that big. We had like five kids because everyone else was like 70 and up. So those five kids knew that they were loved. Let me tell you, I'm pouring all the can. Come on, take more. But now we're in a neighborhood where we have over 200 kids. When we first started it five years ago, it was, it was fine. Like, you know, it went. It wasn't a big deal. Didn't get to have that many conversations. I was like, all right, we just loved them. You know, like no real divine appointments. We just loved them. We have a sign. My kids make the sign that says, you are loved by our family. I mean, we just want people to know that they're loved. And so, can I tell you, year after year, word gets out. And the second year that we did it, I was on the soccer fields. We were watching our kids play soccer. And one of the parents says, oh, I live in your neighborhood. And I tell them where we live. And they said, are you that house that does all that stuff for, th for Halloween? And I said, yes. And they said, why do you do that? Can I share? I just was able to share. Because we just want you to know that you are loved by God. The kids were riding on the bus the first day of October this year. And Josie comes running off the bus. Mom, all the kids are talking about it. It's Halloween. They want to make sure you're doing the big party this year. Why? Because we want our kids to be able to tell their friends that you are loved. Does it cost us? Yeah, it does. It costs us a lot. But it's a practical way that I can share my show my neighbors that they are loved. It's no longer the devil's holiday in our house. It might have started that way, but everyone who walks in is the kingdom. I want to give you a tool. I want to give you an opportunity in a very practical way this Halloween. We bought hundreds of boxes of candy and we want to give them to you as a gift to pass out to your neighbors. Maybe pass out to your coworkers. Maybe you live on a dirt road and nobody comes your way. Take some boxes and just simply listen to the Holy Spirit and give them away and say, you are what a tangible, practical, small gift that can have such a huge impact. We heard the story of Marco, or Mario. He was totally changed because one man gave him a hug in the moment he needed it. And now the impact of he's now releasing that to kids all over. What an amazing story of Ananias, who was just obedient to not preach the gospel, just to walk over to a man and say, oh, in the name of Jesus, he just loved the man. Brother Saul spoke value, and his obedience 
is the reason why we have the New Testament the way we do. Why we have wisdom that literally changes our lives because of one man's act of love. It doesn't stop with Halloween, but it it can just begin here. So in closing, I just want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to ask the Lord right now. We're just going to take one moment. We're going to bow our heads and close our eyes. But I want to give us an opportunity to listen to the Lord, not to me. Because you don't need to just respond to a message. We need to ask the Lord what he says, what he wants to do.